What I'm really impressed with, with Ernest, is the fact that he sings in the most perfect bel canto manner. It's basically the voice never portamentos upwards, so you're always singing absolutely cleanly going up. And you're always slightly portamento down, so every note is joined on the way down. And uh, this, this is pure bel canto, I mean, gold, the, golden, the golden age of singing. This is what they were taught in 17, 1700 and on. This great line, which is, never stops. And again, Ernest never stops the note until it stops. So in many ways, it's perfect singing. I don't think you could do it today. You know, I mean, they'd probably have a microphone up your nose and, you know, everything would be very tightly mic'd, as opposed to one mic, uh, you know, which they, they appear to have then. Um, I just, I just don't think they could reproduce that again, ever, ever, ever. attention was going to be paid to you? Well, I don't think I was ever aware of it, except in practical terms, the number of letters that came in. Letters every day, every week. Also, the fact that people used to come here to the church, either to hear the choir or see me or something. It was so bad that the benches had to issue tickets. But they had to restrict that because people used to come in and stand on these plush pews to see the choir. And we think, what's all that fuss about? We've got our homework to do. It. But success inevitably led to some very strange rumours. When I was in goal for one side, standing here, these two old ladies came up and said, uh, uh, did I know where they were, where they could leave the money for the Luff Memorial Fund, you see, that was after we made here my prayer. So I said, well, what's happened to him? They said, oh, he's dead, didn't you know? There's a memorial for him. I said, well, I think he's alive. I said, how do you know? He said, well, because I'm him, <laughs> you know. They said, wretched boys, and walked away. <laughs> Well, you, there, was a, there was a rumour going around after you made the record that you oh, died. Yes. Oh, yes. Really? Mm. Lots what? of them. I got letters. Uh, one beautiful one from uh, uh, South Africa. A chap who said he knew me well in the choir. And uh, he'd heard I died because they'd seen a picture of me in my cassock and surplus at a poster in a gramophone shop saying the last record of Ernest Luff. Well, it was the last record, <laughs> but not the, the last. <laughs> the <record>. last. <laughs> So, this sort of angelic, I suppose, yes, because on all those record sleeves of you, you do appear as a rather angelic yes, little thing, yes, don't you? Yes, Oh, I died of everything, you know, broken arm, <laughs> broken leg, broken anything, you name it. Anyhow, that was a long time ago. HMV, encouraged by the enormous success of O for the Wings of a Dove, went on to make seven more discs with Ernest Luff and the Temple Choir, but none of them was as popular as that first recording. There was, however, one recording, Mendelssohn's Hear Ye Israel, which remains my father's favourite performance to this day, and the fact that it was recorded at all was something of an accident. The choir had a session on a Saturday morning, and at the end of it, the engineer in the band said, we've got a spare wax. Have you got anything which will fit onto a ten-inch wax? Two sides. So the doctor said, well, the choir's got nothing in rehearsal, so they must go, they've got a big service tomorrow. 
He said to me, is there anything you know which will fit on a 10-inch wax? And I said, no. And he said, well, let's go and have a look. We walked around the practice room out there where all the books were stacked up. And he's going around and he said, uh, he said, do you know he is Israel from Elijah? I said, no. He said, well, let's have a look at it. He got it copied down. We went through it. Within about half an hour, he said, I think we can record that, don't you? He put me down there, right on the corner of the round church, with a microphone. And we made the first test of it for balance. It was all right. Then we did a master. And the engineer said, we'll take that one. And that's the record we got down. It was just, doctor, this is a way to sing it. Marking where you breathe, where you don't breathe. Emphasize this, don't do that. It was as simple as that. Now, half, a, half an hour from teaching. start to yeah. finish. It's, it's a fairly straightforward solo. It's a bit operatic. You'd never seen it before. No. Yeah. And that's not showing off. It's just doctor's ability to teach me, um, certainly getting a bit older then, how to sing this, this work. And he played it through. He went up there and played the organ, and, and it worked. It was a miracle. <laughs> The song and the singer were absolutely inseparable. And I can think of very, very few occasions in the classical realm where that happens. And it's always made me feel terribly sorry for boy trebles who had to follow that record. Because now if someone records it, everyone says, oh, that's over the wizard of the dove, or that comes from Hear My Prayer. But they never say that is Master Boom Boom singing it. And I think that that's quite rare. Can you remember your reaction when your voice broke? Can you remember the day your voice broke and, I, and you thought, well, I'm not going to be singing Over the Wings of a Dove anymore? Yes, quite clearly, because we'd done the rehearsal in the morning and when we went to the practice room for further rehearsal before the service, doctor said to me, Ron Mallet, both head boys, one on Dicano, one on Cantoys, come and sit down. So we went and sat down. And thought, What's the matter? I was singing all right this morning. And he... Before they went to the service, he said, there's a sign of getting tired. So from that point, I didn't sing anymore in the choir as a boy. We knew it was going to happen. There's nothing unnatural about a boy's getting older, dropping out. And so we weren't suddenly confronted with a broken voice. We knew it was going to happen. Thank God it did, to some extent. <laughs> so uh, uh, it was a thing we accepted. We knew it was going to happen. There's no kind of thing, oh, my God, it's the end. It's not the end at all. In spite of the fact that Ernest Luff had become something of a household name, he was now faced with the reality of living the rest of his life after his voice broke, and his first task was to find work in depression-hit Britain. I applied for jobs when I left school, and HMV wrote back and said, well, you can start in the advertising department at so much a week. Uh, report on Monday if you like. But they, they must have said, not the Ernest Luff on our record. No mention of that. I think they, they more or less ignored it. I wasn't ever conscious that Ernest Luff meant anything more than the chap down there who's making the tea to start with mm. and posting blocks and doing all the wrapping up and all that kind of stuff. The real basics required by that department. And whether I sang or not didn't matter to them. What did matter to HMV was that he made more records for them. And less than a decade after his voice broke, my father returned to the microphone as a baritone. Love could I only tell 